thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. I have a feeling that um, if my brother was still around, which sadly he's not, he would have been very embarrassed and would have shuffled off in another direction at Little Sis, being um, here talking about Restoration Theatre. I saw the first preview of this show on Friday night, and if you haven't seen it yet, which I assume you haven't, you're in for an absolute sumptuous feast of visual delight from a company who is serving up Polish dialogue considered to be among the wittiest of its day. It has a plot as complicated as the latest TV serials, but this company make it crystal clear in the course of a wonderful evening in the theatre. So I know you will have a great time. As a writer, skilled in creating comedies and crime stories, Simon Brett's programme notes are a real bonus. And I'm very delighted to have the opportunity to spend just a little bit more time looking into the fast-changing world that Congreve was writing about, the world of commerce and law, of fashion and finance, and the world that I've had particular pleasure in exploring through my research, and which I hope will be of interest to you today, the world of the Restoration Theatre the playhouses, the players, the playwrights, and the audience, for whom Congreve wrote in 1700, and kind of with whom we continue to enjoy this play over 300 years later. In much the same way as today, it's impossible to discuss the theatre without thinking about the politics of the day in which the plays are made and put on. The leaders, the movers and shakers in commerce and government affect the shape and direction of the plays we see on the stage in any period, whether they're reflecting the concerns of society, mirroring our faults and weaknesses, offering challenges to the way we think, or providing escape, and sometimes a bit of everything. I will begin then with some background on the theatre, the politics in and around the Playhouse of the Restoration and after, before moving on specifically to talk about Congreve and his plays, and my own area of particular interest, the extraordinarily strong company of actresses for whom he created the equally strong female parts in this, his most famous of comedies. Along the way, I hope to plant some seeds, some references, which connect to the particular responses and artistic decisions in the current production, and which I hope you will enjoy all the more as you watch the show. So, The Way of the World is usually referred to as one of the great Restoration comedies. But of course, the Restoration begins at the rather unusually specific date of 1660 with the return of the popular merry monarch Charles II, from exile in France. Doesn't he look absolutely gorgeous? <laughs> Love his shoes and his, his, all his bits. The restoration in political terms can really be considered as over by 1689, so really not that long, when William and Mary take the throne after the Glorious Revolution. Well, glorious that is if you weren't Catholic, of course. Charles's death in 1685 hastened the problem of the Protestant succession to the throne. His Catholic brother, James, didn't hold on for very long and fleed the country to live in exile. So this abdication, followed by William and Mary's reign, was also the moment that led to the enshrining of the Bill of Rights, the limiting of powers of the monarch and the extending of parliamentary powers that still pertain today, including the commitment of the monarch not to marry a Catholic. <clears throat> so these were all very important times. The return of the monarchy was not universally welcomed, and it created an enormous amount of turmoil in its wake, not least between the return of the royalist supporters into power and the potential challenge to the position of the merchants, the city folk who'd been running things, and massively expanding trade abroad, bringing in exotic goods, coffee, materials, and basically running things in their absence. But of course, the gap between the 1660s and Congreve's play of 1700 is exactly the same as between 1960 and today. And just as we look to the swinging 60s with perhaps a mix of nostalgia and affection, I was, of course, far too young to remember it. Um, but also, if you look at the number of popular television programmes that are set back in that immediate post-war and 60s period um, called The Midwife, all of the, with, that we're seeing a lot at the moment. And in spite of equally difficult political turmoil, there's something about the way we think about the 1960s today 
which I think resonates very much with the way we think about the Restoration, and something that Congreve captures in 1700 and which still holds a fascination for us. When I was first asked for a title for today, I suggested Fashionable Society, Sex and Strong Women. Sex in the City was another idea, but that would work better for another play of the period. Uh, anyway, my title didn't make it into the programme. But there is little doubt that Congreve and his audience are interested in fashionable society and in sexual freedoms, in much the same way as our society is built on the influence and changes of the 60s today. And it's very much, I think, what restoration theatre, and especially restoration comedy, has continued to mean for us, as we see images of the glamorous King Charles bringing colour and excitement back to England after the dark and dull days of Puritanism. Well, actually, of course, it wasn't that simple, but uh, that's beyond today's brief. And it certainly isn't the way that history has recorded it. This little image here of Charles's coronation is, in fact, from a 19th century juvenile drama backdrop. And I think you can see its 19th century influences. But I show it to you because it shows the strength of the image of Charles's return. Paula Backscheid, a rather interesting American academic, suggests that Charles used the whole of London as his theatre. He introduced colour, he entered the stage of London as he returned. He used imagery and emblem, like the oak tree, to demonstrate his great solidity, his power, his ongoingness and his fecundity. And of course he did produce an enormous amount of children, just none of them legitimate. Um, <laughs> But here he is in all his glorious robes, and this image has very much pertained, I think, for us today. But of course, public theatre had been banned by Cromwell since 1642, and actors were regularly fined, imprisoned if they were caught mounting plays. Private performances in the great private houses, and latterly operas, had of course been put on. But the system of established acting companies and training schools for actors have been largely abandoned in the face of government opposition. So having enjoyed the comfort and pleasures of indoor theatre in France, where actresses were also leading members of the companies, two of Charles's close companions in exile, Thomas Killigrew and William Davenant, were given exclusive rights to form theatre companies in London, with the proviso that women should play female parts. Kind of interesting end to the boy players of Elizabethan Jacobean times, brought about on the basis of Puritan values, that it was not morally right for boys or men to go against the way that God had made them by performing women's parts. Killigrew and Davenant were fantastically clever politicians and very smooth movers, and their monopoly, or duopoly, between the, the two of them resulted ultimately in the Theatres Royal at Drury Lane and in Covent Garden holding exclusive rights to perform the drama, that is Shakespeare, and other, I think, what we would call straight plays, until the Theatres Act of 1843. So quite a considerable stranglehold. Um, and the government control that was given via the Lord Chamberlain's office, a post in the gift of the monarch, his or her government, acted as a censor for all performance in Great Britain, reserving the right to ban or to approve a play, which of course lasted until 1968. So there's a lot of establishing work being done for the theatre that we have today at this moment. Killigrew's King's Company and Davenant's Duke's Company first created their indoor theatres by adopting the French model of the indoor tennis court. Killigrew took Gibbon's tennis court and Davenant's Lyle's tennis court in Lincoln's Inn Field. This was actually a much sounder building and, as we'll see, had a much longer life. So this is the plan for Davenant's house. Um, I'm allowed, I've got a mic so that I can walk around and show you things here. If you imagine that the net, have you been to Hampton Court and seen the real tennis court? If you think of the net of the court is there. So that is halfway down the building. This proscenium stage is sticking right out in its thrust form with the entrance doors and there were also boxes above it. The middle gallery here and the pit, the all important pit. So it was incredibly intimate 
And Davenant very cleverly built his house behind it and indeed housed the actresses with him, which some said was to stop them behaving badly. <laughs> but you see that the scene house was even greater. It's quite hard where you can see the grooves, where the grooves move the scenery in and out. A nice image, which is also reflected in this production, was to introduce perspective scenery, which of course is kind of difficult for us this is a frontispiece um, in showing to a play showing the inside of the theatre, um, and it's quite hard to get excited about it, but I keep thinking it must be a bit like when I saw Avatar in 3D. It was exciting, <clears throat> and that was what we were looking at. But just coming back to this plan, the other thing that is very important about it, I think, is it establishes a basic desire for a relationship between the performer and the audience that actually got cut back in successive generations but was established there now and I think is something that we are now moving back to and of course we see in this wonderful theatre here. Killigrew was pretty quick to move and build a better theatre, a purpose-built theatre on this model and what we now know of as Drury Lane. It opened in 63 in Bridges Street, which is now Catherine Street. It burnt down in 1672. It burnt down many, many times. But it was rebuilt to a design by Christopher Wren. Although, interestingly, there is actually no documentation to exist that exists that confirms Wren entering into a contract with Killigrew. I sometimes wonder if it's a bit like a kitchen design. He said, come in and design me a theatre, and then used it and didn't ever pay him. But anyway, <clears throat> so who were the audience for this theatre. The groundlings of the globe have gone. So who is sitting in this fashionable pit? This was to be, and was indeed, a very public theatre, and the king and his court came out to it rather than the theatre going into the court. Of course, there were still private royal command performances, as there have always been. But the important thing about this theatre was it was the fashionable place to be. And if you are sitting in Chichester's festival theatre in the centre block, you might think of yourself as being in the king's box, perhaps. But equally, if you're sitting on the side seats, you are where the wits and the bows sat and made fashionable comments to one another across the stage. But you are literally in touch with the players in a very particular way. So new plays by aristocratic writers were put on next to the old plays by Johnson and Beaumont and Fletcher. Shakespeare was very freely adapted to suit the taste of the town, and there were many tragedies. But we're more familiar with the bawdy, romping comedies, like Witchley's Country Wife, sharply observed hits at the triumphs of the Cavalier over the country squire, and jibes aimed at the city folk, even though the aristocracy certainly needed the money made by the sits. So this was a theatre in which to see and be seen. And I think that's a very important element. The boxes on the lower levels, you could reach up from the pit and shake hands, and indeed there were sword fights, there were all sorts of things that went on in the theatre. The pit was a rowdy place, you weren't expected to sit quietly, and you all shoved up together, so you could get a lot of people into the house. <clears throat> so Pepys, that inveterate diarist, tells us a great deal about going to the theatre, sometimes rather guiltily, but he obviously enjoyed it very much and speaks a lot about how much there was to see in the pit and in the gallery. The king's former mistress confronting her successor in the audience and, as the stories go, on the stage and indeed behind the scenes. Oh, sorry, I meant to show you that bit first. That is the Drury Lane, the Wren Drury Lane, which you can see is an enlarged version of Lincoln's in Fields. And that gives you a rather better idea, I think, of perspective scenery. I'm sorry, it's a bit light and they're not as strong. So back to Nelly. <coughs> this, I think, is probably the more discreet image of Nelly, but I'm sure you see many others that are less discreet. Um, the actress who has probably more than any other, perhaps, come to represent everything that is alluring, ambitious, and definitely not respectable in the history of the actress. Pepys called her Pretty Witty Nell. He loved her in Britch's role, of course, because he could see her legs. He loved her in comedy, but he was less impressed with her in tragedy. Many comments about going backstage, taking his wife backstage, who kissed them both, and he's also very shocked 
by the bawdy language backstage and also by tatty, how tatty everything looks. It doesn't look as bright and as wonderful as it does on the stage. And there were other notable women in the theatre, of course, the playwright Afra Ben. Jonathan Church directed one of the best productions of Ben's The Rover I have seen at Salisbury Theatre some years ago. Quite extraordinary, Rovers 1 and 2. I wonder whether one day he might put them on here. Mary Davenant, the wife of William Davenant, took over the running of the Duke's company after her husband's death. And Mary Betterton, wife of the actor Thomas Betterton, and she trained young actresses and also coached the princes, Anne and Mary, for a court mask. It's the best image I could find of her. Uh, but Pepys absolutely adored her. He called her Ianthe. So the young princesses were also very impressed with her. And when Anne became queen, she promised Mary Betterton a pension, but she never paid it. Um, Pepys had stopped writing his diary before the first of Afra Ben's plays were produced in 1670. William Davenant died and Nell retired in 1671. So from that early excitement of the Restoration and perhaps what we think about in the 1660s, we're now looking 12, 15 years later at a new generation of actors and actresses beginning to rise under the tutelage of Thomas and Mary Betterton, but also amid the chaos of the anxiety of the succession issue. The financial failure, ultimately, of Killigrew's King's Company. And so that next generation of theatre makers stepped up to the mark and they created a united company in 1682. Charles Davenant, William's son, was patentee, and now there was a complete monopoly on all the theatres in London. The United Company held the rights to all the stock plays, so anything that was there they could do, nobody else could do it. And crucially for the rising playwright, they also had the power to make the decisions about which new plays to perform and by which playwrights. So the decades from 82 to 93 saw new plays by Dryden, by Durfee, by Southern. And when William Congreve had his first play, The Old Bachelor, performed at Drury Lane in 1693, he joined the rise of new voices and influential figures in the theatre, <clears throat> two of whom were to be of particular importance to Congreve. This is not the most flattering picture of Elizabeth Barry. But she was a very strong and very stunning actress. She was adopted into the Davenant household as a child, and so she was brought up in and around the playhouse. She's thought to have been a daughter of a royalist. She was orphaned and brought to England by Davenant. She's also said to have been trained by the Earl of Rochester, who was her lover. I don't know whether you've seen that in any of the films, in The Libertine or in any of those films. And apparently Rochester took a bet with his aristocratic cronies that he could teach her to act. And this is a story that has been picked up by modern playwrights and filmmakers, April D'Angelis in Playhouse Creatures and Stephen Jeffries in The Liberty. Um, I don't think you'll be surprised to hear that I'm far from convinced about this story. But Elizabeth Barry became one of the first real stars of the theatre. She was adored by the audiences, but she was also loathed. And there were many circulations of lampoons about her as a mercenary whore, in terms that in many cases would make Rupert Murdoch blush. I can read you some, perhaps, um, but perhaps you better ask me later if you're very interested. <laughs> <coughs> Barry remained unmarried, thus she kept control of her own money. And what's more, she negotiated the first benefit performance ever allowed for an actress, Actors were allowed one performance from which they kept the profit, but Barry was the first actress to negotiate this. This interesting is um, one for Joe Miller of Congreve's The Old Bachelor. And in fact, Elizabeth Barry also chose The Old Bachelor for her own benefit in 1694. In spite of the many stories about rivalries between um, actresses, Barry had a very successful partnership with a younger actress, Anne Bracegirdle, and it brought them both fame and success. <clears throat> this is Anne Bracegirdle as Smyrna in Ben's The Widow Ranter. Again, you can see how the exotic is very much in play. It's what people wanted to see. They wanted to see the feathers, the Indian headdress, which Ben is said to have brought back um, from her travels. And you can see this exoticism in the costuming. 
So if Elizabeth Barry was Maggie Smith, then Anne Bracegirdle was Judy Dench, or even Julie Andrews, with Barry as Sharon Stone. Um, Barry always played the dark, the mysterious, the femme fatale, and Bracegirdle, the younger and open innocent, although, as we'll see, she pleased the audience greatly when she took on some very feisty and witty characters in comedy. This is Nella's portrait of William III. It's in the reception room at Hampton Court. Um, so you'll sort of sit there and you'll see this amazing king. And Elizabeth Howe and others have actually pointed to the fact that the two figures below are Barry and Bracegirdle. They were modelled on them as also William being graced and approved of by the arts. We have no proof of that, but it gives you another kind of image of them, and I like the movement in it very much from those rather stilted um, illustrations beforehand. Brace Girdle was also adopted into the Playhouse as daughter of Thomas and Mary Betterton and inherited the virtuous reputation of her mother. There were scandals about Brace Girdle, especially when the actor William Mountfoot was murdered. He was run through with a sword as he walked Brace Girdle to her house. Moon was the man, assisted by Captain Hill. He was a great admirer of Brace Girdles, but she absolutely continually refused to meet him. Uh, he was what we might term as a stalker today, and he decided that the onstage love scenes between the players made Mountfoot his rival, so he killed him and fled abroad. This caused a huge scandal, and uh, there were even a little novel written about it, a Roman Aklef with all the little clues as to which was Moon and which was Hill and which was Brace Girdle. But she seemed to have got through this really unscathed, and I don't think Barry would have done so. Brace Girdle is also said to have been Congreve's mistress. Well, why else would he write such good parts for her? And in his will, he left her £200. Collie Sibber, one of the famous fops, um, of the day, was a young actor, and he wrote endlessly about Brace Girdle's virtuous reputation and her popularity with the audience. He says, she was the darling of the audience. It was a fashion among the gay and young to have a tendre for Mrs. Brace Girdle. That's Sibber's apology for the life of Mr. Collie Sibber, written in 1740, so with some hindsight. So who were the audience? How had they changed since the heady days of the First Restoration? I'm sure this Detail will be familiar to you of Hogarth's theatre-going audience. William and Mary were certainly less eager theatre patrons than Charles or his brother James. But just as rising civil servants like Pepys frequented the playhouse, with his wife and without her, so did the city merchants and their wives, with and without their husbands. The fears of licentiousness in the theatres, orange sellers and women who sold much more than the fruit in the basket, continue to trouble the morals of the nation right through to the end of the 19th century. But also we must remember that selling fruit was a very valuable concession, and it always amuses me that Mary Davenant, when the United Company um, was formed, insisted on hanging on to the fruit concession as long as she could, obviously not selling them, but taking the profit. So the old divides between the town, the court and aristocracy, and the city, the merchant classes, the new money and fashion, were still there, but the theatres and their playwrights needed to appeal to them both. I think the only social group that always comes under fire in the comedies is the country squire, the muddied boots, the coarse, unfashionable clothing uh, of the landed gentry, but unsophisticated, coming up to London to see the sights, and in some plays accompanied by his hunting dogs as well, which always causes amusement on stage in modern production. So, Killigrew's Drury Lane, Davenant's Lincoln's in Fields, and for a while, Davenant's new theatre, built for opera in Dorset Gardens, all come under the control of one management, headed first by Charles Davenant, and one company of actors, the United Company. So it was to them and their audience that the young Congreve needed to pitch his plays. This is Nella's rather wonderful portrait of Congreve. He was born in Yorkshire, in 1670, but he spent most of his young life in Ireland, where his father, a royalist, served in two different postings there. Congreve was well-schooled and became a scholar of classics at Trinity, coming to London when he was 21, where he entered the Middle Temple to read law. His knowledge of the law and its power is frequently used in his plotting. 
although it is generally thought that he spent very little time actually studying it and was rather more interested in his ambitions to be part of the literary set. The now ageing playwright and poet laureate John, John Dryden, he'd lost his poet laureateship um, for being Catholic, is always identified as Congreve's literary and theatrical patron. But there is someone else, the playwright Thomas Southern, who was also a very powerful influence. And it has been suggested that through Southern, Congreve had access to the playhouse. He was able to see the actors rehearsing. He was able to hear the reading of a new play. Um, so he wasn't there just as audience. He contributed a song to Southern's play, The Maid's Last Prayer, which was a very fashionable comedy that's also been suggested as an influence on Congreve. Ambrace Girdle played her usual innocent type in this comedy, um, but, sorry, she played against it because it was a play about gambling and she created the role of Lady Trickett, a gambler who uses her charms to pay off her debts. So Congreve's first play, The Old Bachelor, was performed in the same season as The Maid's Last Prayer in 1693. Thomas Betterton headed the cast of leading players, which included Elizabeth Barry, who spoke the epilogue, and Anne Bracegirdle, who also spoke the prologue. The importance of the prologue and the epilogue is often overlooked in modern productions, and maybe it doesn't work now at all. But its purpose was to use the most popular player, more often than not an actress, and it helped if she was very pretty, to plead with the audience to be kind to the playwright. Of course, the playwright only got money from his plays on the third day. So if a play didn't run beyond three days, and many of them didn't, he didn't get anything unless it was published and he made money through the publication. And very often the dedications to the play that you read are really overblown and made to some lord here or some other because in that way he would get a little bit of extra money. But in terms of actually making money on the box office, it had to run for three days. Congreve's next play, The Double Dealer, was put on almost immediately after, um, although apparently it did have some judicious editing by Dryden and Southern. It had the same very strong cast, with Brace Girdle giving the prologue again, and Susanna Verbruggen, also a very popular comedian, especially in Breaches, until she got a bit older and somebody complained that her thighs were too large, which I think is very unfair. Um, and she gave the epilogue. It was very well received, and Congreve was recognised as hitting the right notes for the taste of the town. The restoration comedy plots of cuckolding, women chasing husbands and lovers and husbands chasing unfaithful wives, they were all still very popular, as they still are today. And Congreve made these work alongside entirely new elements. He made very clever use of the contemporary scene, the places and occupations of the fashionable society, the gambling houses, the coffee houses. This is a rather intriguing image I found. It's actually taken from a French um, image of a coffee house, but it's sort of been changed. So where there's tiles on the floor in the French, it's been floorboarded. Um, and where they were hanging hats up, they're looking at the images. But it's a, a bit of a strange mixture, but it obviously sold well. Um, and it does convey, I think, the fact that the coffee house was the place that you went to talk and discuss the matters of the day with your fellow men. The other place is St. James Park. And again, this is a very glorious prospect of St. James's Park. But it was fantastically fashionable to walk, to meet other people, to be seen, or indeed not to be seen with the wrong person. Congreve matched the scenes with the desire for fashionable society to smart repartee and witty dialogue. He was writing very well-observed comedy of manners. And he had a very experienced company of players to create his plays in performance. However good a writer you are, if they don't deliver for you, it's not going to work. He had promised his next play to Drury Lane, but there was a rebellion in the air of the theatre and Congreve had to choose which side to back. Alexander Davenant, William Davenant's younger son, had taken over the patent and he'd taken over the management of the United Company. And although Betterton, the older actor, who was now well into his 60s, was running things in terms of plays and the company of actors and actresses, Alexander Davenant still held the purse strings. In December 1693, Alexander fled the company and the country, having committed a series of frauds. 
including cheating Elizabeth Barry out of some six to eight hundred pounds, which just demonstrates how much she had saved and earned. And he had effectively sold the patent to a lawyer, Christopher Rich. Now, the antipathy between the lawyer owner and the creative team in the theatre company doesn't sound that unfamiliar today, where the tensions between profitability and creativity are often fraught. The outcome of this particular head-on clash resulted in the players appealing to the Lord Chamberlain for a licence to form their own breakaway company, which would return to the original theatre in Lincoln's in Fields and once more create a two-company system in London. The licence was granted, and for the first time in British theatre history, the names of actresses appear next to the names of actors, headed by Thomas Betterton, with Elizabeth Barry and Anne Bracegirdle following straight after as licence holders, and also ultimately as sharers in the profits made by the company. Sharers were always restricted to the actors, and their wives were paid their money was paid to them, but the share always went to the actor. But in this company, for the first time, the actresses were on the licence and were sharers. Now, Congreve has been identified very much as a key mover in the negotiations for the breakaway company, and some said he was also a sharer, but there is no documentary evidence for this or for any other playwright. It was the player's company. But it was to Congreve's new comedy, Love for Love, that the company turned to open their first season in April 1695. Love for Love was an outstanding success with an almost unheard of run of 13 consecutive nights of performance. Again, Elizabeth Barry and Anne Bracegirdle play their opposite types. Barry as Mrs. Frail, a woman of the town, and Bracegirdle as Angelica, which, as her name suggests, is a beautiful heiress of impeccable virtue and useful for her lover, Valentine. Um, she has a considerable fortune. Thomas Betterton spoke the prologue and Bracegirdle the epilogue, both of which actually begged the audience to support the new theatre and its breakaway company. Congreve and the company he was writing for were a huge hit, and his next play was eagerly awaited. So why was it five years before The Way of the World first appeared on the stage? The changes in society between um, 1660 and 1700 were reflected in many ways in the antipathy between the town, the old power, and the city, the new money of mercantile expansion. It was not far beneath the surface, this battle between the two, but deals had to be struck, accommodations had to be made, and unions forged. And again, I'm sure a familiar image to you all of Hogarth's marriage à la mode, where the city gent is striking the deal for the young woman to marry an aristocrat. London was growing. The fashionable spaces of Hyde Park and St James Park were being made even more fashionable by new buildings to accommodate the new wealth and ways of living. Lady Wentworth writes to her son about a house that he's taken a fancy to at number 31 in St James's Square, and she writes like this. It has three large rooms forward and two little ones backward. Closets and marble chimney pieces and hearths to all the best rooms. There is two pretty closets with chimneys and glass over them and pictures in the wainscot over most of the chimneys. There are brass locks to all the doors. This was important. Public and private spaces were becoming more defined, privacy more carefully considered as an important space to guard and especially for the fashionable married woman. So although the Restoration had advocated more romantic freedom for women, Arguments made forcibly by Afra Ben and many other female playwrights about the right to marry for love. This didn't spare women from the fact that once married, their fortune and their future was entirely in the hands of their husband. New laws, new marriage contracts were created to protect wives from profligate husbands. But the way the husband used their money was central to marriage negotiation. The young widow was a great prize if she had money and looks she might be had outside marriage too, but that was a risky business, particularly if it ended in pregnancy. The older widow was less favourably prized, of course. Her money was attractive, but she was mocked if she followed the younger fashions or dare express a desire for love and generally become seen as a figure to be treated with or cheated out of any financial control. 
This is a wonderful picture of Mrs. Pitt, who died at the end of the 18th century, playing Lady Wishford in her older years, and as you can see, being fortified by the cherry brandy, which Millamant um, is banned from using. So amid a society as interested in avarice, scandal, and sexual freedom, as we might have been said to have been in the 1960s or even today, there was also another set of voices rising in the closing years of the 1690s, 1960s, 1690s, the Society for the Reformation of Manners, actually very like Mrs. Whitehouse and the Festival of Light. One of the main targets for reform was popular entertainment. And in 1698, the Reverend Jeremy Collier published a clearly directed attack in his treatise entitled A Short View of the Immorality and Profaneness of the English Stage. The chief target for his attack was surprisingly not the actresses, neither was it the female playwrights, three of whom had had considerable success on the stages of Drury Lane and Lincoln's Inn Fields. But he was interested in the plays of Vanbrugh and particularly William Congreve's comedies. Collier's attack was not really very interested in the plays on stage, although he did object that women should be presented as lewd and thus actresses made to say lewd words. But his real interest was in the ideas about society as conveyed by the plays when they were in print, so as literature. And it's on the literary grounds that Congreve attempts to defend his work in a public rebuttal entitled Amendments of Mr Collier's False and Imperfect Citations. Congreve claimed his comedies were intended to laugh men out of their vices. He suggests that Collier has merely dragged his plays from their place in nature and transplanted them in the dung heap. The business of comedy, Congreve says, is to delight and instruct. So defending himself and his work from Collier's charges against immodesty, profaneness, abuse of the clergy and encouragement of immorality, Congreve argues that Sometimes, to repeat a fault, to report a fault, is to repeat it. Congreve defends his work hotly, but he does conclude that Collier is simply using the theatre to get at the whole of society through a medium that's connected only with reasonable pleasure, as he says, down with the theatre, right or wrong. And this anti-theatrical feeling comes back again and again in waves. So the argument that the pit could decide for itself if there was a double entendre intended in a play, and if they saw it and enjoyed it, then it was their conscience, not the playwrights, that might be troubled, this defence didn't really wash with those who believed in the upholding of moral values in the public sphere, any more than it has in subsequent generations. So while Congreve was fighting it out with Collier, other new plays, including Vambrus, The Provoked Wife, comedies by Mary Pitts, by Susanna St. Livre, were well received. The Players' Company at Lincoln's Inn Field managed to hold on, in spite of competition from Drury Lane, who adopted a really weird and interesting line of competitive attack by putting on a number of satirical impersonations of the old actors and actresses in their most famous roles, including an imitation of Betterton, Barry and Bracegirdle in Congreve's first play, The Old Bachelor. I kind of suppose it was a bit of a spitting image, really. So The Way of the World was first performed at Lincoln's Inn Fields in 1700. There is no doubt that the battle with Collier is still firmly in the minds of everyone in the playhouse, and the prologue spoken by Thomas Betterton includes the following commendation to the audience. Some plot we think he has, and some new thought, some humour too. No farce, but that's a fault, for so reformed a town who dares correct. To please this time has been his sole pretense. He'll not instruct, lest it give offence. Thomas Betterton as Fainall, opposite Mrs Barry as Mrs Marwood, of course, and the handsome John Verbruggen as Mirabel, opposite Bracegirdle as Millamant. It was bound to please, and it did. But while it was not the box office success of Love for Love, it's certainly Congreve's most enduring and revealing comedy on the society of the day, and indeed, his last play. The mirroring of society in public and private in and through the characters is introduced and played out in a masterly patterning. The occupations, the preoccupations of the fashionable are exposed, while the negotiations of new relationships are played out with care and precision. 
The ambitions of some, the servants foible and wait well are keenwardly, upwardly mobile, are more favourably presented than those of others, the fashionably foppish Whitwood and the self-advertising petulant, who I'm sure would be tweeting himself today. So I don't want to say too much more about the play. I don't want to spoil your enjoyment. But Congreve does write cracking parts for women, not always as sympathetically as Millamant, who was not only inspired by Brace Girdle as an actress, but I would suggest as a woman who determined her own future in the changing world around her, whatever the cost. Mrs. Fainall does perhaps pay the price for her indiscretion, unfairly, you might think. And what of Mrs. Marwood and the wonderfully frightful Lady Wishford? Does Congreve treat them well? I leave it to you to ponder. But these are roles that have attracted some of the greatest actors and actresses to the play, and Congreve has certainly provided the materials in this very fashionable comedy of manners in which we may still recognise the ways of our world. Thank you. Thank you.